is Joe Navar from the Snaps, and our buddy Lionel who's here with us this week to do some performances before we head up to Lansing, Miss Michigan. So I just want to say thank you so much for being here and for taking the time to, to listen to the story. In today's panel, we're talking about this idea of like redefining what's offensive. Like who gets to decide what is offensive to a people? Who gets to make those decisions? And what happens when we wrap laws around that particular thing? But before we kind of dive into that particular story, I would oftentimes like to begin with giving you a little bit more context of who we are as a band, this band called The Slants, and, and what we do. And that actually begins not in the Supreme Court, which is what we're kind of best known for, but in a prison. So in 2011, I was invited to perform at the Oregon State Penitentiary. Now, as a Johnny Cash fan, I was pretty excited about this. <laughs> I had my outfit planned, I was gonna wear all black that day. I thought this was gonna be amazing. But I didn't really think about like what it would be like to send an all Asian American man into a prison with one of the highest populations of neo-Nazis in the country. It didn't cross my mind that this could be a particularly dangerous idea, not while I was filling out the waivers that said I would not sue the state if we got you know, injured, shanked, maimed, killed in the prison. I was like, you gotta sign this stuff just to go to a high school these days. It didn't really cross my mind until we were going through our second set of metal detectors on that day. You see, as we were walking through, um, one of my band members talks to the guards and says, hey, you know, we wear suits and vests and things on our plane. It's July, it's really hot out. Is it okay if we take off these bright orange safety vests, that the kind you play flag football with, because they were given to us? Is it okay if we remove these when we're performing? The guard looks at us and he says, sure, but if something happens out there, those vests let us know who not to shoot. <laughs> of course, I was like, yo, can I get two of them vests? <laughs> I don't wanna lose mine. And that's when I started feeling anxious and I started thinking, you know, I don't know anything about prisons or prisoners or inmates. Like the only stuff I knew came from books, magazines, TV shows, uh, movies, and they did not have very good things to say about our prison system. In fact, this is years before Orange and the New Black came out, so I didn't even think of the prison as some kind of industrial complex for white supremacy. I was just like, bad people go there. And this was a maximum security prison, so who do they send there? Like, the worst of the worst, right? Not just drug dealers, but rapists and murderers. So as we start walking through, I get filled with a little bit of nerves. It didn't really help as we started approaching this area that they called the Big Yard. Now, the Big Yard is a large field at the size of a couple football fields in length, and it's surrounded by 30-foot high walls. Along those walls, you can actually see these sentry towers where they had searchlights and mounts for weapons. At the end of the big field, there's a small concrete stage, about the same size as this one. And that's where we were supposed to perform for nearly 2,000 inmates that day. Now, I noticed that the only thing separating us and, you know, the 2,000 inmates were these bright orange safety cones that matched those vests we were given, and a thin line of yellow police tape that said, police, do not cross. Of course, I, I looked at the guard and I was like, excuse me, I don't know if, um, they follow instructions like this? I mean, that's why they're in here, right? They, they can't follow instructions. He's like, no, don't worry, we got a plan. I'm like, well, please tell me, what is it? He's like, if something happens out there, we need you to drop everything. Just drop it, leave it where it is, don't take anything with you, and run behind you. There's a small uh, chain link fence behind you. We'll be on the other side, so as soon as you're through, we'll secure the gate. Like, okay, so let me get this straight. If something happens out there, you want us to just drop everything and run. You'll be on the safe side. <laughs> and if we make it through in time, you'll lock it down? Like, he was like, well, that's not exactly how I would put it, but yeah. Like, where did you get this plan, The Walking Dead? Like, I thought this was a federal institution with like history and processes. But with those fears, filling my body, we decided just to take the stage anyway. And we begin performing. And you know, something magical happens when we get to share our art with folks. It doesn't matter like, who's there, who's in the audience, because like we're there sharing something deep from deep within. We're sharing our music. And something just really incredible happens. 
So the crowd begins to start building around the stage as we begin playing. And let me tell you, when we launched into our cover of Paint It Black by the Rolling Stones, it was so incredible as they begin to watch the sea of orange jumpsuits start jumping up and down to our song. I see a mentor and I want to paint it black. No colors anymore, I want it to turn black. I see the girls walk by dressed in their summer clothes. I have to turn my head. As we continued playing, our 45 minute set got turned into a two hour marathon of music that day. So the guys were having such an amazing time. And we're having such a good time, we just kind of forget where we are. Until after our show, I'm hanging out right by the border, on the safe side of the police tape, of course. And I notice that there's this group of large, shirtless white men. They start walking towards me. And as they get closer and closer, I notice that they're just covered head to toe in tattoos. The two words in front, from the man in front, jump out at me. White power. I begin to feel nervous again. And I look for my band. They're 20 feet behind me, just breaking down the equipment. I look for our guard. He's 50 feet away, breaking up a different fight. When I turn back around, the man is there, just an arm's length away. He hands me a piece of paper and a sharpened pencil. And then he begins to ask me for an autograph. At that moment, I'm, I'm frozen. Like, the only thing going through my mind is that scene in Jurassic Park where they're like, if you don't move, the T-Rex won't see you. <laughs> I, I thought maybe that would work. But it didn't. He clearly, clearly saw me. And as I'm just standing there, he says just a few words that cut straight through me. It's for my daughter. Can you please sign it? Like, of, of course. Of course I'll sign this. And so I, I take the paper, I turn it over. It's a makeshift flyer he made about our band playing in the prison. And he's just like, I want to tell her I met the band today. And so I begin writing a little note to his daughter and asking him questions, mostly questions about, like, you know, what grade is she in, and that sort of thing, and avoiding questions like, so why are you in here? Because, <laughs> you know, can't follow instructions. <clears throat> and we, we're having this little exchange, I give it back to him. Then he tells me, he's like, you know, just the fact that you'd be willing to talk to me, like, and have this conversation, it's, it's incredible. He's like, I made a lot of mistakes in my life, and there are ones that I don't want my little girl to make. I can't change what's stained into my skin, but I could change what's in, what's in here. I could change what's in my heart. So thank you. You know, we both walked in that day with all kinds of assumptions. I was literally judging him by his skin, but once we actually had that conversation, things change. Things can be powerful when you actually have the ability to engage. I started this plants in 2000. Uh, seven, because I wanted to change people's assumptions about Asian Americans. You see, the only things that people knew about Asian people, at least growing up in the 80s in San Diego, California, well, they learned from pop culture. And let me tell you, decades before Crazy Rich Asians was killing it, they did not have very good things to say about us either. Like, I grew up with icons from Full Metal Jacket, or you know, people saying lines like, ooh, me so horny, or characters like Long Duck Dong, thinking like that's what represented us as a people. It was dehumanizing. And people assumed, like, oh, you grew up in San Diego, it's a really diverse place, but those experiences weren't all positive. Like, I'll never forget that, what it was like going into classrooms and having teachers, like, basically play into these particular stereotypes. And, like, watching idly by as I just got made fun of every single day, tortured by my classmates. There's this one particular moment that jumps out at me, and I think, kind of set the path for me to start a band called The Slants. I was in seventh grade cleaning up the, the PE field because every day different students had to take a turn to clean up the, the basketballs and volleyballs left over while everyone else hit the showers. 
And on that particular day, as I was cleaning the things up, I thought I was alone. But I very quickly realized I wasn't when I was shoved to the ground. I could still remember the distinct feeling of having gravel just go right into my skin, creating instant blisters on the, the palm of my hand. And as I turn around and look at my tormentors, I notice there's four of them. But it doesn't scare me that there's four of them. I, by that point, I was kind of used to that. What was actually terrifying to me was the fact that they were grinning. They weren't angry. They weren't hateful, it seemed. They were enjoying that moment deeply. And then the fists and the sand began to fly into my eyes and into my stomach. They began kicking me over and over again as I hit the ground, yelling the words, Jap and Gook, over and over again. I was terrified. I didn't really know what to do. So at one point, I just finally snapped. I said, I'm a chink. Like, you guys are so stupid, you don't even know how to be racist properly. They stopped. They were shocked. They, they were just stunned. They walked away and they left me alone. A couple years later, I think I remembered something of that particular lesson. You see, I was best friends with this guy named Kyle. And Kyle and I were like the punk rockers in the early 90s at our high school. This, keep in mind, was before Hot Topic was hitting every single mall in the country. So the idea of, you know, having spiky hair or, a, you know, homemade safety wallet chain, like wallet chain of safety pins, like that was not, <laughs> I mean, it's targets, essentially. But one day, Kyle comes to school and he's got this bright pink hair. And it's spiked up into 12 inch Liberty spikes all over his head. And of course, it's like, Kyle, you look so cool. You're so punk. Well. The other people at the school did not care for it. He got all kinds of sideways glances, all kinds of frowning faces from the school officials there. And I remember I had to meet Kyle at the end of the day, right in front of the school where parents pick up their kids. Uh, I was running a little bit late, but as I got to him, I noticed he was surrounded by about a dozen other kids. They're pushing him, pushing him. I'm just watching my best friend get tormented by these these very much larger kids, as they're saying, what are you, some kind of fag? Some kind of queer? Pushing over again, why do you look like that? Why do you look like that? What's wrong with you? And at one point, someone says, what? how come your mom lets you walk out the door looking like that? And so I just decided to step in and answer the question for him. He said, excuse me, maybe it's because his mom isn't stupid and ignorant like all of you. And she doesn't judge people by how they look, but like what's on the inside. I thought this was a great logical answer. <laughs> they didn't take it that way. Instead, they directed their attention to me instead. And they began pushing me in the chest, just calling me Jackie. What's up, Jackie? You want some of this, Jackie? What's up? And I was like, I'm in classes with some of you guys. My name's not Jackie. And then that's when I realized, like, they said the full name, Jackie Chan. And I'm like, I'm not Jackie Chan. I don't look anything like that guy. He's got a goofy grin, a giant nose, and more importantly, he knows something that I don't. Martial arts, like he, Jackie Chan could take all these guys. I definitely could not. But I did the only thing that I could think of in that particular moment. I struck the one karate pose I knew from karate camp from fifth grade when I hung out with my cousins for a summer, and they stopped. They're like, whoa, 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 we don't want none of this. It's, 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 okay. it's okay. They backed off and let us off the hook. I wish I could say all of my experiences in high school and growing up were filled with these clever retorts and moments of bravery. But sadly, they weren't. Most of the time, it was filled with fear. And most of the time, I was quiet as people just punched and threw rocks at me and did all the awful things that kids can do. At one point, in 11th grade, I walked up to my dad and I said, Dad, I'm ashamed of being Chinese. I broke his heart. My parents worked so hard to take care of me and my siblings. It wasn't until I moved to Portland, Oregon. I just had this brilliant idea of dropping out of college a couple months before graduating to tour in a punk rock band and <laughs> moved up there. There, in Portland, aka it's America's whitest major city, I started missing my culture. I started mil missing like elements like the food that I was used to eating growing up, hearing the, my first languages. 
And so I started doing things to make up for it. I would import films from Hong Kong, mostly from Jackie Chan, uh, coincidentally, and just started getting into it again. And it was around that time period that someone's like, Simon, you like all those movies of like the Asian mafia? You should check out this movie called Kill Bill. And I was like, okay. I missed it in the theater because I was on tour, so I bought it on DVD the day it came out. And I'll never forget, like, watching this bright yellow disc with three black lines on it as it slides into my DVD player, and I began watching it. You know, it's a Quentin Tarantino film, it's entertaining, great dialogue, but there's this one particular moment where this woman named Oren Ishii walks into a Japanese restaurant with her gang of crazy 88s. Now, to anybody else, this is just a trademark Tarantino move. Like, people are walking in, the music's kicking, and everything seems awesome, you know something's gonna go down. But for, for me, it was really different. It was so profound that I just paused the movie and just thought, like, why is it affecting me in this way? And that's when I realized it was the first time that I had ever seen an American-produced film that showed Asians as cool, confident, and sexy. I'm in my 20s at this point, and I thought, wow, if, if, if Hollywood is bad, then the music industry is worse. Like growing up, I'd never seen Asian Americans on the cover of Rolling Stone or Pitchfork or Spin or even on, M on MTV back when they used to play music videos. And it was then, at that moment, I decided that something needed to change. And so I decided to start a band. And I got the name from just questioning my all-white friends in Portland, Oregon. Hey, what's the thing you think all Asians have in common? And they would say, slanted eyes. It's slanted eyes. It's really interesting because, first of all, it's not true. Like, not all Asians have slanted eyes. Second of all, we're not the only people on the planet that have any kind of slant to our eyes. But it went even deeper for me because, like, it was these eyes and this hair that got me beat in school over and over again. I was ashamed of having my family's eyes. And I thought, I'm not the only one. There are other kids out there like that, too. Instead of having this be something we're ashamed of. Why not turn it into something we could be proud of instead? And we could sing about our own perspective or our slant on life of what it's like to be Asian American. So we decided to kick things off and the response was incredible. Like I started getting all these handwritten letters from kids throughout the country saying, thank you, thank you for existing. Thank you for showing me that it's possible to be Asian American and to play rock and roll. Thank you for sharing your stories of being bullied because we identify with them. And those kids began to sing along as we wrote this song that was reappropriating an old schoolyard rhyme that, you know, kids used to walk up to me and say, Chinese, Japanese, dirty knees, look at these, pull their eyes back. Well, we decided to change, to change that into an anthem that would be a movement for our community. It was incredible. 2008, we got our first feature on NPR's All Things Considered. As a public radio geek, I was particularly thrilled about this. They were talking about how there's this Asian American band that was finally flipping the script, turning stereotypes upside down by, about our community. And we started getting reported on in every single Asian American newspaper in the country, playing festivals, doing anti-racism workshops, and really kind of building this community of supporters. But then something happened, as it oftentimes happens when you begin to make friends with an attorney. That attorney says, Simon, you're getting all kinds of press, you're doing really great things. Maybe you should file an application to register your trademark. And I thought it was, like, it sounds expensive. He's like, no, 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 don't worry about it. It's only a couple hundred bucks, and in like six months, this whole thing's going to be over. You got nothing to worry about. Things turned out a little different than that. I'll never forget, in spring 2010, just a few months after we started this process, he calls me up and he says, Simon, we've got a problem with your application. I go, what is it? I, you know, I thought I filled out something incorrectly. 
he gave me a discount because I worked on some of the forums myself. So I thought, oh, I screwed that up. But this is not enough. All the forums were fine. But the trademark office is rejecting your application because they say the name of your band, the Slants, is disparaging to persons of Asian descent. And I was like, does disparaging mean what I think it means? <laughs> Yo, are they saying we're racist to Asian people? <laughs> and he says, yes. I'm like, there's all kinds of offensive stuff out there. I didn't even know there was a law against this. Like, what does it say? He proceeds to read me what they call Section 2A of the Lanham Act. It basically says you can't register trademarks that the government considers scandalous, immoral, or disparaging. And in this case, they said it was disparaging. But it's not just what like, anyone considers disparaging, so it's not like the general population. They said that a substantial composite of the reference group has to find it disparaging. So in this case, tons of Asian Americans have to be like, really, really upset by our name for them to deny us this very basic commercial right. And I'm like, okay, uh, we just wrapped up this tour. We just toured across North America. We worked with 140 social justice organizations. Who do they find who's offended by our name? Says, no one. Like, well, what do you mean no one? You just told me it has to be a substantial composite. Said, no one. But they did quote UrbanDictionary.com. And there's uh, photos of Miley Cyrus pulling her eyes back in a slant eye gesture. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. So like, no, I'm, I'm looking at Miley Cyrus right now. It's pretty offensive. But, but like, no, Asian Twitter was already on that, son. Like, we, like you, you're telling me that stuff that wouldn't even be acceptable in a junior high classroom is now being used by the federal government to deny me rights. And he says, yeah. But I think they're wrong on it. You obviously have a lot of support, so we can fight this thing. And so we, we fought it. For the next year and a half, we sent them thousands and thousands of pages of evidence. Incarceration camp survivors. We had a dictionary expert who was the head of the Linguistics Society at uh, Duke University. We had two independent national surveys that showed that only about 8% of Asian Americans found their name dispersion. So 92% were in support of us. This is really important because the government never actually defines what substantial composite means. The only time they ever talked about what this mythical number was, was in another case for the Washington football team. And in that case, the trademark office said 36.6% of Native Americans who find the term red skin to be disparaging, that is not a substantial composite. It's not good enough for them. So we thought 8%, well that's a lot lower. We piled this on with newspaper articles, magazine articles about our band in every single Asian American newspaper in the country. It was the biggest appeal in the history of the United States over a rejection under this particular law. We sent all this over and the trademark office continued to deny our registration. We said, no, that's not good enough. UrbanDictionary.com says it's offensive. <laughs> we also found this dictionary from Great Britain from 1938 that says it's offensive. So clearly, this matters more than the voices of your community. Shut down. And around this time period, uh, my attorney, uh, Spencer, he shows me the exact words. He said, oh, your effort was basically laudable, but ultimately not influential. So as part of this little Christmas present of a rejection, Spencer said, also says, Hey, law is really hard, so I'm not going to renew my license next year. You're going to have to find a different attorney. So as I start thinking about our case, I remember there was this guy named Ron Coleman out of New Jersey who blogged about our case. And I thought, well, this guy seems kind of smart. Um, he's got all those like really cheesy America Super Lawyer logos on his website. Like Maybe he knows something about it. And more importantly, he supported our position. <clears throat> so we talked to him and he agreed to take the case on pro bono. But he says, no, no, as long as you fight like this, you're not gonna win. You guys have done a great job, better than anybody else has. He's like, but nobody who's ever appealed on this law has ever won. They always tell you you can fight it, but in the 70 years that this law has been in place, not one person has ever won an appeal. So he says, we should reapply. And this time, we'll apply with what he calls the 
ethnic mutual application. You see, there will be nothing in my application that says we're an Asian American man. Nothing except for my Chinese middle name will indicate that we have anything to do with Asian culture. He thinks if we reapply with this kind of application, we'll get a different examining attorney who will just rubber stamp it through and just say, oh yeah, slant is a normal everyday word. In fact, the trademark office has registered it over 800 times. I'm the only person in uh, the entire history of the country to be denied a registration for the term. So he thinks maybe we'll get one of the other people. We reapply and they give us the same examining attorney. And he copies and pastes his rejection once more. That's right, Urban Dictionary reappearing in my life yet again. <laughs> Miley Cyrus back on it again. And he says, no, we, we, we're not going to let you do it because it's, it's disparaging. So we decided to, to change our perspective. We decided, like, well, maybe instead of arguing, instead of arguing, like, whether it's offensive or not, maybe we should ask them why. Why are you making this particular decision? After all, if the government's given out trademarks like candy hundreds of times for the term slant, why is it in this application, what is it about this application that says we shouldn't get the trademark? Well, they wrote back and it was actually really disturbing. They basically said we were too Asian. <laughs> They said, it is incontestable that the applicant is of Asian descent. Therefore, the mark is disparaging. In other words, what they're saying is like, we were Asian. So people, when people saw our faces and they saw the name the slants, they would automatically assume racial slur instead of any other possible definition in the dictionary. But another way of putting it was, anyone can register the slants as long as they're not Asian. And the problem was, like, we had too much Asian stuff going on. In fact, they said, like, look at the website. There's Asian people all over the website. I'm like, yeah, that's like my face. <laughs> and they're like, you got dragons and rising suns and pagodas and stuff on your band's merchandise and your album covers. I'm like, yes, we're using the artwork from our respective cultural heritages. But they said, no, that's just too much Asian stuff. And I'm like, if you were to actually chart out that logic, it would look something like this. Like, the more Asian we became, the more offensive we become to ourselves. Like, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And of course, the problem is, not just that we're, we happen to be Asian American, although that was the main issue. The, the problem was that we were like, not just and happened to be Asian, we were like this Asian American like superhero band doing anti-racism workshop. We were just like way too Asian for them. So they denied it and we decided to kick it up. And this time, instead of just filing at their office again and again, we went up to something called the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit in Washington, D.C. It's the second highest power in terms of the judicial uh, system in, in our entire government. In fact, it's right across the street from the White House. You can walk there from there. And there, at the Federal Circuit, we won. Nine out of 12 just judges said, like, not just that we were not disparaging, which they did agree with, but they said that the government was violating my First Amendment rights, that our, our right to free speech. Two of the judges dissented saying, well, we don't think it's a constitutional issue, but we do think the trademark office is wrong. The ban deserves the trademark registration. They are not disparaging. Well, would be normally a happy ending, ended up being a longer wait. Because six months later, we still did not have our trademark registration. And then, I get the notice in the mail. The US Trademark Office, along with the Department of Justice, was suing me. They were taking me here, to the Supreme Court, the final <laughs> boss stage of my particular adventure. And there we would argue whether or not this law, Section 2A of the Lanham Act, was violating the First Amendment. You know, for our particular story and our journey, it was all about perspective. We wanted to change the perspective of how people viewed Asian Americans. We wanted the ability, the dignity to choose what's best for ourselves without the government making those decisions for us. And as part of that perspective-changing experience, I thought, hey, it's really important to 
to have the band there in person. Apparently it's not very common for rock bands to appear before the Supreme Court, so they were not guaranteeing us seats in the room. In fact, most of the time, if you are a named party in the case, they don't even, you, don't, you don't even sit in that room. But we, we, we decided, like, if those justices are gonna be making decisions about us, if it's gonna be a room full of white people arguing about what's offensive about Asian people, Asian people need to be in that room. So we crowdfunded our way there, and we somehow finagled our way to get four tickets to get into the Supreme Court for my own hearing. And as we flew to Washington, D.C., and that particular week, we released a new album for the occasion. We dedicated the title of the album, The Band Who Must Not Be Named, to the trademark office. <laughs> and we kicked off this particular album with our track, From the Heart, which is a loving, open letter to not only the U.S. Department of Justice and Trademark Office, but to anyone who had doubts about the power of reappropriation. Sorry if I lost to shout. Sorry if I voice to wrong. But make the pen a weapon, censor of intelligence until I thought came nothing at all. Sorry if you take offense. Made up as I'm played pretend But know you feel shame It's something so strange But nothing's gonna get in our way There's no room For your backwards feelings And backyard dealings We're never gonna settle Never gonna settle No, we won't be made sad No, it's hard to find a moment We sing from the heart And so, a few days before going before the oral arguments of the Supreme Court, it was Martin Luther King Jr. Day. We did, it was decided to basically commemorate that occasion by going to the memorial and playing songs and singing with the people there, honoring the legacy of Dr. King. It's actually one of my favorite places in D.C. because there are these incredible quotes all throughout the memorial, especially at night as they're lit up. There's some kind of uh, power to those words. And I remember walking up to my favorite quote from Dr. King and, and just meditating on those words. The moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Because I started thinking about it. At this point, I had been in the fight for almost a decade, fighting for the right to register and use our name. Like, I, th I looked at those words and I thought, that arc doesn't bend on its own. It requires patience. It requires persistence. And it requires people willing to stand up and fight. And as we spent that week in DC just talking to people, going to schools and speaking about our story and, and doing interviews and that sort of thing, we ended the week the night before with a dinner in a Chinese restaurant in Chinatown with a journalist from a Chinese newspaper. And I didn't really think a whole lot about it until we were given these little fortune cookies at the end of the meal. And there I thought, I never believed in these things before, but maybe I'll make an exception this time around. <laughs> so the next day we, we get up, we get ready to go to the Supreme Court, and it's, it's the city is in chaos because the presidential inauguration for Donald J. Trump is taking place two days after the oral arguments here. So everything's on lockdown. Call for an Uber to get us to the court, he turns on Morning Edition on NPR. And as he, we're listening and driving, he's like, Supreme Court, what are you doing there today? Then, on the radio, I hear my own voice. It's my interview with Nina Totenberg. And our singer says, oh, that, that's him. We have to go to court today because we have to go to court. And the driver said, oh, wow, can we take a selfie? <laughs> like, uh, maybe like after you're done driving, please. <laughs> Selfie in hand, we walk up the steps, we go in through this side entrance that feels like TSA pre-check because we get to skip the line, and we walk into the room. There's Roman columns all over. It feels like it's a place for gladiator-like com uh, combat. And I don't know about you, but like I grew up watching these kind of courtroom dramas and films, and I always imagined 
things going down a particular way. Like, there's going to be somebody with a really impassioned speech, their tie all loosened up, maybe in a slight southern accent and the sweltering heat, like, you know, demanding for freedom. But it's nothing like that. In fact, I can't even sit anywhere near my attorneys. They had the attorneys up front, right below the dais where the, the justices were to sit. There's four rows of what they call members of the court, which are basically, it's the, the seats paid for by attorneys paid extra to be a member of the court. And then there's like rows of pews, where I call the common people section. There, in the second row of the common people section, that's where we are placed. And as we were sitting there, it became very obvious to everyone around us, like four youngish looking Asian American dudes in suits, that must be the band. And so it creates a little bit of a commotion. People start talking to us, law students are like, whoa, you're like in the band? Like, this is amazing, because those justices, they're like, you know, mythological creatures. They only come out of once in a while, but you hear about them all the time. And then the woman next to me raises her hand and signals the bailiff, and she's like, excuse me, like, this is Tam. This is Tam of Levy Tam today. Doesn't he at least get, get a better seat, at least in this first row? And I was like, well, I have to check with the solicitor general. Keep in mind, that's the guy who we're arguing against today. Solicitor General, the highest ranked attorney in the country. He goes over there. Ten minutes later, he comes back and says, I'm sorry, but we're saving the seat for just in case someone important shows up. <laughs> oh, this cuts. Like, why? <laughs> but I'm fine. I'm not going to be able to speak anyway. I can't make that impassioned speech, otherwise, I'd be kicked out. So, as we watch, they begin oral arguments, and it's like a firing squad. The attorneys go up there, and then any justice can ask a question. They can interrupt each other, they can change directions, they can basically bring up whatever topic they want. They can ask you about any single case that they believe is relevant, and you gotta be on your feet. And I'm just watching this thing go down, and I'm getting very, very frustrated. Because it is a bunch of, like the, the Solicitor General and the justices, a lot of Mostly, like, well, 100% non-Asian people arguing about what's offensive to us, using my name over and over again, using the name of the band, and I'm like, you guys don't know me. You aren't there. You aren't there as we are, like, counseling kids who've been bullied their whole lives. You're not there as we're playing for, like, bringing families together who survive incarceration camps. You aren't there as we are doing all the work that we're doing for our community. You're just basically taking the moment to say whatever you want about us and not allowing me to speak. And I'm just like, they don't get it. This, for, for eight years, they did not get it. I, I just felt like, what is the point of all this? But then, this little voice pops up. It's Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She asked the government attorney, she's like, doesn't it matter? Doesn't it matter that Everybody knows the slants are Asian. They're not using the word to disparage, but to describe and to remove the sting from the word. I'm just like, yo. I think I'm in love with the Supreme Court Justice. <laughs> Notorious RBG, bring it in. And the only thing that the government attorney had to say was, we found a lot of articles on the internet that suggest absolutely, I wanted to scream, no, like you're talking about Urban Dictionary. You're talking about the fact that the government decided to quote two anonymous posts on white supremacist message boards instead of listening to our own community about this. But we had to remain silent. I mean, just the profound irony that I was fighting for free speech and I could not say a single thing for myself. So we walk out of the courtroom as I'm walking down the plaza, I'm just, my head is swimming. It's, it's filled with emotions because I'm just like frustrated about like almost a decade of fighting. And I notice that the, the plaza outside of the court, it's filled with like hundreds, if not thousands of people. And I'm thinking, what are all these people doing here? Like courts in session, there's no tours today. But as we start walking down those steps, the crowd looks at us, they notice us, and they begin erupting in applause. They begin cheering as we walk down. And I'm just like overwhelmed by everything. I have no idea what's going on until I hit those bottom two steps. And I walk down onto the plaza and these two kids run up to me. Simon, Simon, 
our parents let us ditch school to be here. I looked at him, I was like, yo, you got Asian American parents, so they let you ditch school? These <laughs> parents. But they said, we flew from California to see for our entire lives. We heard about you. We heard about the one who's willing to fight for the dignity of our community, fighting for the right for us to determine what's best for ourselves. We want to go into public policy development because of you. These guys are freshmen in high school. And they knew what public policy development, development was. And it was there at that moment I realized it doesn't matter if we win or lose in the court. We already won. We already stirred up this conversation. We started this movement. And it's, it's going to be rolling. They, these kids, they're awesome. They're going to take over. And so I walked over to the corner where there was this media circus uh, off the side of the court full of cameras and microphones. And I'm, I'm there. So looking at my attorneys, the, the attorneys are looking at me, the reporters are looking at all of us, and they're like, do you have a statement? Do you have a statement? And I asked my attorneys, and they, they're like, no, we didn't prepare a, a statement. <laughs> like, Simon, do you want to say something? I'm like, absolutely. So I grab the mic. I say the speech, the mini statement that I wish I could have said in the courtroom. If the government truly cared about fighting against racism, by using the trademark office of all places to do so, why did they choose to fight this battle against an Asian American ban? Why didn't they begin by canceling the registrations of the KKK or Stormfront or for other white supremacist groups? That's because they don't care. They want to use bad language to be this distraction against bad policy. You see, we shone a light on them because it turns out that the law they were using, they were using it to target minority voices. You see, people of color, members of the LGBTQ community, we tend to be groups that reappropriate language, turning something from shame to pride instead. But that made us prime targets for the government to suppress our voices. They didn't like that we exposed that part about it. Of course, nobody in the media picked up that story that, that night. So we just had to left it, leave it for the people there in that particular space. But it was always about changing that perspective. And as part of that, for the next few months while we waited that, for that decision, we decided to go on tour. I had this idea, it'd be the trickle up theory. We're gonna play at as many law conferences and law schools and IP bar associations as possible in the country, hoping that those clerks for the Supreme Court had their ears to the ground and maybe they would actually hear the story that would never be contained in legal briefs. About six months after that hearing, I wake up at six in the morning because my phone is going crazy. I look, I miss 763 notifications. <laughs> Something happened, I guess. <laughs> I check it, and it, on Twitter, on the top of my feed, is OPB, Oregon Public Broadcasting, the, the local NPR affiliate, they wrote, SCOTUS rules in favor of the slants. 8-0, unanimous victory. You know, it was always about trying to change that particular perspective. It was just about addressing assumptions, just like in that prison. There was this outdated law. We decided that it needed to go down. It needed, needed to take it on. And I just want to close with this particular story because I think it kind of helps capture that, that experience and what I believe is the working model for trying to create social change using art. It goes back to an old bit of co copyright law, actually, and it goes to this concept that people used to nickname Paper Town. Has anyone heard of this before? It's like a John Green novel and film. But Paper Town is basically a fake place on the map. So back in the day, cartographers used to uh, as they were creating their maps, would put a fake town or mountain or some kind of geographical feature on their map. That way, if somebody else published their map and it had your paper town on it, well, you knew they stole your work, so you could sue them. In 1938, the General Drafting Company publishes their map of upstate New York. And at the foothill of the Caskill Mountains is this little town called Aglo. Aglo is just an anagram of the two guys' names. Now, nothing really happens until a couple of decades later, when Rand McNally publishes their map of New York. And there, on their map, at the same in intersection, in the middle of nowhere, is this town called Aglo. So, 
the other company is really excited. They call them up and say, we caught you. We're going to sue you. That's, that's a paper town. And of course, Randy McDowell said, no, we would, we would never do that. So they decided to settle by driving to this intersection in the middle of nowhere. As they pull up, they notice something. There's a town there called Aglo. You see what happened is people kept driving to this intersection expecting there to be a town there. Now, one day, some guy just decided to build it. And he called it Aglo because that was what was on his map. And the fascinating thing to me is not necessarily about this, how this came to be, but the, the most interesting part of this has to do with the assumptions. You see, we assume that our maps are shaped by the world around us. Like, we know where the mountains are, we know where the state lines are, and there's your map. But a far more interesting thing happens when you change your assumptions. And you start realizing that if you change the process in which you create the map, you can literally change the world. Just by taking that moment to change your assumptions about what, what the law is like, of what is possible. And you start thinking like an artist or an activist, like instead of thinking about what's possible or what is, you start thinking about the world you want and start working your way towards that, that's when you can literally change the world. So, thank you so much. We don't have to I want to mention that if you're interested in this story, I got a memoir coming out next month. It's called Slanted.